let's talk about the biggest single idea that isn't being talked about enough, that honestly has such strong implications for the future, that we honestly could be in a very, very difficult spot going forward with the League if things go the way that this idea is being presented. Let's go to this article published on Sportsnet by Elliot Friedman a few days ago on June 25th. This is before the entry draft lottery, etc. This is talking about the CBA, the NHL, and its collective bargaining agreement. It opens up by talking about Artemi Panarin's big long tweet social media post that he also posted onto Instagram on the NHL and its escrow, which has brought itself up as a talking point. This Artemi Panarin post is pretty much just a protest as to how the status quo is right now. But the article asks, why exactly is Panarin so upset? And in order to actually go through this, I will admit I don't know too much about this CBA escrow money stuff to give you a proper answer myself, so I'm just going to go reading through big parts of this Friedman article to discuss what exactly is the problem that we're talking about in this video. During a time of beer bug spikes, with rising numbers of positive tests across all sports and the clock ticking closer to the scheduled July 10 opening of NHL camps, players will be soon voting on a CBA extension. According to multiple sources, the potential agreement between the NHL and the NHLPA caps the escrow at 20% for the 2020-2021 season. Original guesstimates were escrow at 35% if the year does not finish, and 27-28% to even if it did. But there is a second layer, a one-season-only 10% salary deferral by every player. I'm told this is not a rollback. Players will be returned that money in the future. The benefit for them is the escrow on it would be lower. Now, what exactly is an escrow? Well, let's go to a CBC article published in 2019 talking about the escrows in the NHL and what that actually is. Here's how they work. Players and the owners split the NHL's hockey-related revenue 50-50. Players get their share in salaries. At the end of the playoffs every year, both sides get together and count up how much money the NHL made that year. Then, they use that number to estimate how much it will make the next season. A 5% bump is a typical ballpark. The salary cap, which is designed to make sure the players get 50% of the revenue and no more, is then set based on that number. So, money that the NHL makes from its revenue is split 50-50 between the players and the owners. The salary cap is then adjusted because if the NHL is able to spend more money, they can do that if they think they're going to make more money in the future. Which is why this whole beer bug situation has thrown a big monkey wrench in that situation. Going back to the Sportsnet article from Elliot Friedman, this is why there may be a 10% salary deferral for every player next year. Now that's not taking it away, players will be returned that money in the future. Here's another way to look at it from that same Sportsnet article, a source compared it to a payment plan that you might negotiate with your credit card company. From an ownership perspective, every dollar owed the teams on the 50-50 revenue split will be repaid over the balance of the CBA. Now here's the big part which is why we're making this video in the first place. Normally, I wouldn't discuss a topic like this because it's so complicated, so deep, and so difficult to understand, but this next sentence right here is really easy to understand, and we can all understand why this may be a bad thing. As part of the agreement, the salary cap will be kept close to the current $81.5 million for the next three seasons. There is potential for it to go up 1 million in 2022-2023. Okay. Ignoring everything about the escrow and the payment rollbacks and all that stuff, take a look at that idea. $81.5 million. The salary cap not going up for three years. Whose team gets affected by that? We have a number of teams in the NHL right now whose teams were built off of the idea that the salary cap is just gonna go up. Teams like Toronto signing the Marner, Matthews, and Tavares contracts under the guise that the money is going to be 
you know, more readily available as the years go on. Teams like Vancouver, who are relying on the salary cap to go up in order to re-sign to Foley, Markstrom, and Tanev. Teams like Vancouver also have dead money in guys who don't play to the standard of their monetary value, like Louis Erickson, like Jay Beagle, like Sutter, not to mention Roberto Luongo's money, who's still over there. The Vancouver Canucks are one of the teams that'll get screwed by this. Not to mention all the teams that are looking to find ways to sign their star players, potentially at hometown discounts. Tory Krug is a guy who is probably not going to go back to Boston if the money available to sign him for does not go up. You gotta look at Petrangelo in St. Louis. You gotta look at the Golden Knights wanting to re-sign Robin Lehner. The salary cap not rising will be the death of the San Jose Sharks. All the money tied up into those old players with no room to get anybody new or re-sign some of their bigger talents. Like Kevin LeBanc, honestly, I don't know if that really counts anymore. It probably did a year ago, I'm not too sure about now. But that article that we looked at from Elliot Friedman was published on June 25th. The next day on June 26th on ESPN, Greg Wyshynski, which you all know Greg Wyshynski, he used to be on Merrick vs. Wyshynski, which was a great show back in the day. He published this article talking about how the NHL and players are closing in on a deal for a new CBA, and I wanted to take a look at this article as well. The framework for the new CBA extension would be around a six-year term, according to sources. Two of those years would cover 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022, before the current CBA was set to expire in September of 2022. Sources said there was some wiggle room on that term, and that another framework being discussed was a little longer. Wachinshi's article also goes over the escrow, and it goes over it in a very well-put kind of way. I will give it to him for writing it like this. One major issue is the escrow. The current financial system in the NHL involves a 50-50 split in revenue between the players and the owners. The system, which calls for a percentage of withholding from players' paychecks each season, maintains that balance by either funneling money back into the owners in the case of a revenue shortfall or having it refunded to the players after the season. With the losses in revenue this season, it was speculated that the escrow could rise as high as 35% for the players. For a point of comparison, escrow withholding for 2018-19 was 12.9%, with 3.25% returned to the players. The official escrow loss for the players that season was 9.65%. That means that when it comes to the money that the NHL was actually able to gain, 50% of it went to the owners, 50% of it went to the players. But of that 50% that went to the players, 12.9% of that was actually held. And they didn't actually give 50% of it, 12.9% of that 50% was held, and 3.25% of that 12.9% was given back which means that they actually lost out on 9.65% and the NHL players were making less money. This article then goes over that 10% thing that we talked about with the Sportsnet article. A 10% salary deferral was something supported by both sides of the bargaining table. With escrow set in the neighborhood of 20% next season, that money would be paid to the players under what is assumed to be a lower escrow rate in two years. It's not a salary rollback, like what the players experienced in the 2005 lockout. The players get the money back and will keep more of it than they would under next season's considerable escrow rate. So maybe, just taking a look at all things considered, a 10% rollback with the new escrow would be better than just getting the other escrow overall because you get a little bit more money from the money that you would have been entitled to just taken away from because of escrow rules. Also, this goes into the fact that the salary cap may not go up, which in a vacuum seems like a terrible thing, but it could contribute to just the overall well-being of the league going into the next few years, financially speaking, this whole beer bug thing, shutting down the process of making games monetizable, playing games, having the fans there, advertising dollars, there's so much money that the league is missing out on from all this stuff, which is why we're having this crazy discussion here where the salary cap may not go up for three years, and escrow rates could be a little bit higher, but there could be rollbacks on the player salaries, and it's all... 
very, very difficult to understand at face value. Which is why I tried making this video, and I tried to get people who were smarter than me to explain it by reading some of their articles, but I don't know if what I did here was all that great. So if anybody out there thinks they got this down and they understand how this whole process works, feel free to correct me if I didn't explain this properly, and feel free to just go at it in the comments and let everybody know what's up, because this is a crazy weird and difficult topic to analyze, so I hope you enjoyed this video at the very least. Look at the comments below. Somebody probably smarter than me commented, most likely, I would say. Social Dice Trolls 99, and bye.